15 or so, 70 people now. I think I can then start, it's five o'clock. So it's a good afternoon to all those who are joining from Norway or other parts of Europe and good morning to those who are joining from North America or Latin America from Rio or Mexico City or Houston or from California. Our uh, guest lecturer this time is Professor Ellen Burnham, the inventor and the writer of the world famous Sweeney and Burnham article on vitrinite reflectance kinetics and probably that article has been the most referenced, most cited article in APG in the last uh, 30, 35 years. I guess you all uh, know the, the method and the article itself. And now we have uh, an excellent opportunity to talk to Alan himself. He will show the details of this kinetic scheme. Very shortly, uh, Alan has a Bachelor of Sciences from Iowa State University in Chemistry and a PhD from University of Illinois Physical Chemistry. And then after that, he worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for 31 years on oil share retorting, petroleum geochemistry, kinetic modeling, laser fusion material science and energy materials. He was also the chief technological officer for American shale oil for seven years. And then afterwards, he joined Stanford University as adjunct professor. And he is now involved in this very famous basin and petroleum systems modeling group at Stanford University and also still consultant for Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So basically in the next half an hour, he will give us a very good overview of how the vitrinite kinetic modeling has evolved and uh, what is his best uh, new results and, and uh, best practice in the area. So basically all of you, if you can uh, mute yourself, except Alan, of course, and then if you have questions, just write them in the chat. And at the end of the presentation, we will read up the questions. So. Alan, the floor is yours, and I just switch off my camera and mute. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I uh, uh, enjoy this opportunity to uh, get back to talk about some of the fundamentals of, of vitrinite reflectance and how things have gotten to where they are. Um, I'll, I'll start off by uh, let's see here. Yeah. Start off by mentioning that the uh, the oil industry is changing. I suppose you all know that, uh, and uh, BPSM is evolving. Um, just this week, it has formally changed its name to uh, Basin Processes and Subsurface Modeling, remaining uh, you know retaining the acronym, but changing the scope of what it works on, um, including carbon sequestration, gas hydrates, carbonate models, etc. Here. And, and so if you're interested in more details about uh, the BPSM and, and, and where it's heading, uh, I've given the contact information here for both Allegra and TAPAN uh, for uh, further information. So I, I start out by telling, uh, by mentioning that uh, I have Norwegian roots. My mother's brand, uh, a maiden name was Branstad. Um, my relatives came over in the late 1800s uh, from Norway. Uh, which is uh, quite common, of course, and, and, and uh, family homesteads are down here in Branson, which is close to Oxendal, um, and a uh, larger city here is, is uh, Molda. And in fact, I, I've, I've been to the, uh, the that area three times. My sister's ashes are actually scattered uh, in the, uh, the family uh, farm at there uh, a few years ago. So I'll start out with reviewing some things that I'm sure you all know. This this has been known for many, many years. A paper by Bahar and Vanderbroek in 1987 talked about the elimination of hydrogen-rich species from kerogen uh, and eventually becoming more aromatic and the aromatic rings under the uh, both chemical and uh, uh, geotechnical forces tend to align each other. Um, and and so the the material becomes denser, becomes more absorptive, and it becomes more oriented as as maturity proceeds. And the reflectance is related to uh, both refractive index and absorption indices. And and uh, the absorptive indices, which I've underlined here, I changed this from a previous uh, saying that 
uh, it's really primarily the absorptive indices that are dominated by the size and orientation of the aromatic rings. The refractive index is to some extent, but um, uh, it's, it's a much smaller effect, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, Again, in a matter of a general review, you can lump vitronite reflectance models into sort of three general categories. Um, if you go way back, um, you know, there are simple correlations with temperature, and uh, a Barker's geothermometer is one example of that. Um, on, on the right hand end, there's the uh, molecular modeling, which tries to uh, calculate the composition of the material and estimate reflectance from that. And, and the example of that is Vitromat, which was published in, I think, 1989. Um, in the middle, there's kind of a hybrid uh, where you're using sort of a chemical kinetic uh, index, but you uh, then correlate that um, conversion to reflectance. And in, in this bottom um, portion of the figure, I, I've given Kind of a genetic tree, if you will, of lots of different uh, uh, models that have been developed over time. I won't go through it. Yeah, obviously, uh, if there's any questions about anything specific, I can I can answer that. But uh, the point is that there's lots and lots of different models, and for some reason, uh, uh, easy to know zero is the one that seems to be the most prevalent uh, used. Um, and and I'll uh, one of the points of this is I think. Uh, people should probably make a change. So my, my takeaway advice is don't use easy to zero, zero anymore. It has some serious weaknesses, mostly having to do with the, the high maturity. And uh, this was actually uh, pointed out many years ago and uh, then uh, bought, uh, brought to the fore again with uh, by uh, uh, Soren Nielsen uh, in a publication. So. So I was working in the Vaca Muerta under a project uh, funded by Total, and uh, you know there's not vitronite there, and so I, the the question came up of of how to estimate maturity, and so the I went back to the vitromat model, saying, well, okay, if I can calculate the composition of of bitumen, then certainly I can estimate its reflectance, and and that essentially developed a suite of models, which uh, for type one, type two, type three type materials that can uh, have the reflectance um, estimated. And so um, that's I, those are certainly my preference. There was an intermediate to the DL model, which I, I'll mention, but it, I don't think it's as good as the, the V model for uh, for vitronite. Um, the these models. Um, these easy percent of zero models were developed to uh, reduce computational time. Um, I, I don't know that that's important uh, with uh, today's computer. In fact, I showed many years ago you could use second order reactions to cut the, uh, the computational time by a factor of two. Uh, that didn't seem to uh, catch on. But if there is a desire to reduce computational time, there are ways that the algorithms can be made faster. Um, being a chemist, I prefer the vitromat approach because it's more rigorous and adaptable to organic uh, matter. And then one thing I'll touch on at the end is the issue of vitronite reflectance suppression. There's been an argument as to whether or not it really exists. To a large extent, it's due to misidentification of, of vitronite. But true suppression can uh, uh, can exist, and I'll uh, quote some uh, uh, data from uh, uh, that was done by Ken Peters on, on that topic. So we can go back to the 1950s, um, and, and people started to go back and look at the fundamentals of what causes refractive index, um, which, which even date back into the 1800s. So the first thing here is the uh, Lorentz-Lorentz equation. Um, and then uh, if you have an absorbing material, um, you also have an absorptive effect, and, and this was again known back in the uh, many, many years ago, but then re applied in the sort of 1950 range for for coal. And then finally, the the, re uh, the reflectance here, the Fresnel Lambert law uh, has both a ref refractive index and the absorptive contributions. And here's, the, you know, again, the data back from the uh, 1950 
era. So we'll we should talk then about two uh, the two contributions. Um, there, uh, in any chemical structure, there are localized and delocalized electrons. The localized electrons um, basically are, 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 are sigma or isolated pi bonds, and, and you can consider them uh, with the Drew to Lorentz model. And this is just a uh, an example of of, of a, a figure of this where you can actually <laughs> change the oscillator frequency and the damping frequency. The damping frequency relates to the the width. And of course, the oscillator frequency gives you the peak, um, and and so that's that's essentially the the core electrons that are uh, uh, giving you the, the the primary density effect. And then if you get um, you localize pi bonds, you can get electrons traveling over a significant difference. And you know, in undergraduate physical chemistry, people talk about the particle in a box model, which came up uh, in quantum mechanics back, you know, basically a hundred years ago. And, and uh, this is the this is the kind of, of, of electron that gives the contributions to the uh, at high maturity uh, to the uh, uh, absorptive index. So the localized electron contribution can be estimated by group activity rules, and um, and and so. Uh, there's actually been a there was a book by Van Crevelin on polymers which uh, gave this general rule this its additivity rule for how to look at the chemical structure and estimate its refractive index. And to, uh, to a first approximation, uh, there are certainly differences in the chemical structure, but to a first approximation, you can kind of use these values for the elemental composition, which suggests that if you know if you can calculate the elemental composition of the material, you ought to be able to Estimate its refractive index reasonably well, and um, here uh, notice eliminating hydrogen and oxygen from the from the chemical structure increases the polarizability density. So polyvinyl acetate uh, has uh, has oxygen and has the lowest refractive index. Uh, polystyrene has eliminated um, hydrogen relative to polyethylene, and so it has a uh, higher density, higher uh, higher refractive index. So. So now let's consider the various contributions uh, of, for hydrocarbons. And, and so people talk about, um, you know, aromaticity being um, the thing that causes uh, the refractive index to go up. And that's partially true, but it's not strictly true. If you think about diamond, it has a high refractive index, uh, greater than a mature carrageen. But there's no aromaticity here. It's a tetrahedral structure. Um, and an anthracite, you know, uh, has a, uh, a lower refractive index. Um, and, and so then you get into graphite and you have, uh, it turns out that there, um, the refractive indices, parallel and perpendicular, are not that much different. It's really the absorptive index that gives you the, the anisotropy. So if we go back, back and look at various model compounds, we can see that uh, when you're talking about the low, uh, high hydrogen to carbon ratio, or low maturing material, the primary effect of, of reflectance in, is re really refractive index based on, on density. And here, here are, um, here are uh, 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 liquids and solids, and they tend, uh, as you get the, uh, to high, uh, or well, to low hydrogen uh, index, high re uh, refractive index, they tend to, to converge. You extrapolate this up to here, um, the, uh, the minimum value for uh, graphite would be estimated to be about, about 1.8, which is also about its reflectance. And here you can see now a correlation between refractive index and density. And this is this is really what's going on during the oil generation is, is really the, the primary change in reflectance is due to densification, not aromatization per se. And, and, and finally, again, to re reiterate, uh, the primary contribution to reflectance is the absorptive term parallel to the aromatic ring in graphite, which then comes into play when you go to very high maturities. So I added this uh, slide from previous um, presentations about anisotropy. Again, the oil generation is down here. There's really not much anisotropy. It's, it's really at the higher uh, reflectances that you start to get this aromatic of this anisotropy due to the orientation of the pair uh, of the aromatic rings, but note that the minimum reflectance here is, is 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 actually much higher than that of graphite. 
So it's still not very well oriented. Um, and I've taken this uh, this figure from th this paper here uh, by Mookie, because uh, nobody can pronounce his name, <laughs> who quotes data from Sharkey and, Mc and McCartney. So if you go back to pyrolysis work that was done back in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, you can see that what, what's happening in generation from generation of hydrogen, uh, excuse me, methane and hydrogen, is that you have a, a spike um, here uh, early on uh, in, in methane related to oil generation. And then, but there's a second hump here um, for uh, that's independent of, of, of the material. And this is primarily due to the condensation reactions of, of these aromatic rings eliminating methane as they as they fuse together. And the same is true of hydrogen. And th so these these are really the the condensation reactions which are giving you the polyaromatic material. There's really not very much polyaromatic material in uh, in um, in an immature carrageen. And this is the one thing that gives you the uh, the, the long pi bond resonant links that goes into that particle in the box quantum mechanic uh, model that I mentioned earlier. So I didn't really know anything about uh, vitronite reflectance back in the middle 80s, and I reviewed a paper um, that gave a chemical kinetic model for vitronite reflectance. It really didn't make any sense to me. Um, and, and so, um, it, but it got me thinking about the the topic, and so I, I thought, well, okay, I, I, I know I, I knew from my work as a graduate student that refractive index was due to related to chemical structure by relatively simple uh, group additivity concepts. Uh, so I figured, well, if I could calculate the composition, then I can calculate uh, um, the refractive index. Uh, and then certainly there was this data from McCartney et al. Uh, showing that the hydrogen to carbon ratio correlated with vitronite reflectance. And there's also a similar correlation with carbon content. So I, I essentially went off and did the, uh, calculated the, uh, the, the elemental conservation equations here, um, and then uh, developed a, a chemical kinetic model that essentially started, you can put in any uh, essentially starting composition in, in the appropriate kinetics, uh, generating uh, hydrogen carbon dioxide uh, oil and, and methane and then calculate what the elemental composition was and then correlate uh, that with uh, vitronite reflectance. Um, it was noted, you know, shortly thereafter uh, by Ulrich Ritter uh, from IKU that that uh, that the data uh, from uh, Tech Mueller in 1979 suggested that the, the the break in the curve of reflectance versus depth was sharper than calculated by uh, the easy percent R zero algorithm. We didn't really uh, spend very much time up here because we weren't really concentrating on the high maturity uh, per se. But uh, the, there was an IKU model back in 1996 that, that essentially had this this uh, sharper break. And 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 uh, it also there, there's a, certainly a debate here as to how uh, whether or not there's a suppression and, and how sharp this break is. But I think the evidence is pretty clear that when you go up to high maturity, the easy percent of zero uh, underestimates the maturity. Um, so Nielsen in 1987 published a, a paper. Um, uh, Reiterating this fact, it wasn't really new, but he uh, had a fair number of uh, basin data and, and, and developed a model that that essentially came along here. And and after working on this for a while, I decided that well, he was certainly correct that in this higher maturity, this is this is a fact. But I think he underestimated um, the refractive index here uh, based on. Um, Evidence uh, that a lot, a lot from the North Slope of Alaska that uh, Ken Peters and Stanford people had been working on, and this may be related to this vitronite uh, suppression issue that uh, we talked about. If you use a hydrogen-rich shale in, in your in your calibrations, it's uh, you can have uh, a problem come up, as I'll discuss a little bit later. Um, the other the other fa issue is what is the frequency factor? 
um, that you should use in these things. And there's no, it, it's really hard to come up with a, uh, a way of, of fitting this uniquely um, from, from vitronite data. And uh, so you, you kind of depend on um, some combination of theory and, and inference from chemical um, uh, experiments. But if you go back to the, uh, the original 10 to the 13th, that's sort of a kind of a, a hand waving uh, frequency factor, which is commonly used in, in physical chemistry. And so that's what I picked uh, back in the 1980s. It wasn't very well founded um, in the, uh, you know, in terms of the fundamental data. Um, and and the, the ability to do kinetic experiments has, has, um, has greatly improved from the mid 80s when we started uh, up into the, the mid 90s. And so if you start taking a look at all the the data here was here was the original work that we did of 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 the probability of the frequency factor you know centered around 10 to the 13th whereas if you look at the later data which is really much better it looks like the mean frequency factor is more uh in the in the one to two uh, times 10 to the 14th range so that suggests that uh, we needed to revisit the frequency factor um there's a uh, uh, Nielsen in his paper mentions that based on our zero does not work at, uh, as well at laboratory time scales for human coals, and it's it's worse than easy to present our zero. And so he, here I've collected a lot of data from the literature and, and done the calculation. You can see it, it just really is really is not very good. But I, I also bring up the observation which was made in our original paper was it uh, from hydrous pyrolysis and then later a confined pyrolysis, there's really uh, two populations here of reflectants versus uh, the, the experimental conditions. These are the, the humic materials and these are the, the marine materials. And, and so it brings up, uh, brings up the question, uh, easy to know zero doesn't really match the, the vitronite all that well at laboratory conditions. Shouldn't we have a model that works both at laboratory conditions and geologic conditions. I mean, this is actually not bad if you consider, you know, the orders of many orders of magnitude of, of, of time uh, difference, but one could do a better job, it seems. And, and so there was a paper uh, published uh, by Huang from Exxon, and, and uh, And so I, uh, so he, he, th this was using a, uh, you know, a, 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 a frequency factor. Actually, I think this is a, I have to go back and check. I think, I thought this was a 10 to the 15th. This may be a typo here, but suggesting that the, fre the frequency factor really ought to be higher. Um, and I will uh, uh, then follow that by by eventually by going into the, the 10 to the 15th, I think is the really right answer. But in an in a intermediate uh, form, I used uh, uh, 10 to the 14th is, is the improvement. Again, here's the original vitronite data showing that it, uh, with the two correlations, it actually agreed better with the, the, the type 2 carrigens than it did with the coals. Um, and, but then, the easy uh, the DL model, which used this frequency factor based on on primarily uh, uh, marine carrigens, um, it had this bigger uptick, but it still missed um, the uh, the range uh, at, uh, at at the lower uh, temperatures. So so we still had a problem, and, and I, uh, I I know that uh, uh, Ken likes this model. Uh, it, it works well at the Alaska North Slope, but I think uh, it's it's not as good as can be done. So so I uh, I found it worked much better if I went to a frequency factor of 10 to the 15th. So, and so this then is is the uh, optimization of the model uh, uh, published. Uh, it's actually published in uh, early 2019. It was done. The work was done in 2018. And and so the easy percent of the V model is actually just um, adjusted to agree with the Vitramat. The Vitramat is the basic model that was used, and then this was just uh, optimized to be given the same answer. So, so uh, here's where I'm getting back to the the evidence that um, there are better models than the original model, and I think people should think about uh, moving on. Um, and 
So here's now uh, Lauren Hackley recently published a paper. This this was just kind of a, a reiteration of, of the original data. Um, so let's go back now to the a broader range of materials and we'll co compare these various models. Um, starting with the green one, this is this was the one that most people still use. Um, the V model actually agrees reasonably well with it. It's just slightly below, but then it, it bends more and agrees with um, basin uh, scenario zero up, up in this higher maturity. The DL model is a bit more suppressed. Um, whether or not that's truly vitronite is, is debatable. Um, this is what I believe um, is, is actually a problem with uh, suppression um, or uh, misidentification of vitronite. And then finally, since you can use this for any uh, uh, material, the algorithm for uh, a bitumen or uh, is the same as a well, type 2 um, kerogen. This would be then the reflectance you'd expect to see for, for that material. Um, so one of the one of the issues of, 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 of calibration is you have to make sure you uh, have good uh, data for calibration. These are not fundamental in the sense that you're not calculating parameters for first principles. You're, you're calibrating the data. And then so I was able to increase the the, the amount of data available to, to do the calibration. Um, it, it, it actually uh, uh, agrees pretty well with the previous one. But one of the things that really note here is that this particular um, ge geologic sequence, which was kind of used to uh, 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 to calibrate the model, seems to be um, distinct from these populations of, of laboratory experiments. And this is something that I think I, I would like somebody to take a look at is, you know, what really is the real range of, of geological world and, and laboratory experiments? Are they really as different as this seems or is this merely some you know, one M member of, of the, uh, the the population. The other issue is this issue of curvature down here and at the at the very low maturity, high hydrogen index. I think uh, that still needs to be clarified a bit. And so what I'm suggesting here is that there still are improvements that can be made um, from a, a fundamental standpoint to get a model which uh, works over a wider range of conditions. Um, so uh, there were there are other data that I did not use in the calibration, uh, but I here now I do the calculation, and you can compare to uh, this data from uh, Kyle Ruth and from the Penn State database. It, it works pretty well. Here's some some data for Bertrand, and he went to much lower maturity, and so you can see that this this is kind of going off in the in the wrong direction. And I believe what's happening here is that I was modeling a trend which was fairly flat. And I really didn't pay much attention to this low maturity. But during the very early stages here, of, of uh, which is probably diagenesis rather than uh, uh, catagenesis, you're really talking about primarily the loss of, of water. And, and so the, the vitamin model, if, if, if a person is really looking to go out to this immature of a, uh, a vitronite, you really probably should uh, modify the, uh, the kinetics to have this uh, more labile loss of water included. Um, here then comes up the issue of, of, of the frequency factor again. Um, the DL model used the, the frequency factor, which was came from essentially kerogen. And this says that, that the relationship between vitronite reflectance and, and oil generated is the same in the laboratory and in, in nature. However, um, there is some evidence from from laboratory experiments that coals tend to have a higher uh, uh, frequency factor. And if that's true, then you don't actually have the, quite the same relationship between um, the laboratory uh, generation and, and geological generation. And the same was true uh, really here uh, using this frequency factor of 10 to the 13th from, from the opposite direction. So here's where the, the issue uh, of, the, of the frequency factor comes into the fore. And it turns out that this one was the one that seemed to do the, the best agreement, as I showed earlier, uh, with laboratory experiments as well as maintaining the same geological uh, match. So um, again, I've mentioned this before, but I'll reiterate um, the 
the bitumen at 2018, I gave parameters for type 1, type 2, and type 3, and then here is a comparison to the data from Hackley and, and, and Lewin in 2018. And, uh, and we, we didn't know how to do this. Uh, we had not done it back in the 1980s. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do once you have the data to do the calibration. calibration. So the other thing I would like to point out here is the, the relationship between uh, bitumenite reflectance and bitumen reflectance. And um, one can now calculate this, this curve for a type 1 and type 2 kerogen and compare it to uh, data from a, a lot of workers. It all falls along this line. Um, and, and so these, these models, uh, the type 2 kerogen model, works extremely well over the entire range of conditions. So if, if you don't have any vitronite, uh, you know, I would recommend using this, this type 2 model, which um, yeah, here, I'm uh, sorry, here. Um, and then the last topic I'll uh, uh, close on really is the issue of vitamin uh, suppression. And, and uh, Paul Hackley and uh, Ken Peters did some work, which uh, in retrospect is kind of like, why didn't somebody do this decades ago? Uh, they, they mixed they made a synthetic rock by mixing uh, true vitronite with a uh, with cement and uh, and a uh, Green River kerogen to see it, uh, if if the kerogen suppressed the the vitronite reflectance compared to uh, not being present. So they did it in various ratios, and and sure enough, they did find that if you add a hydrogen rich uh, kerogen source, you do get a lower reflectance at the same experimental conditions. Now, it, it turns out that somebody uh, who worked at uh, Phyllis Petrol Petroleum uh, had told me about doing similar experiments back in the 1990 time frame. I don't think that work was ever published. So in some sense, the inclusion is not new, but it's, this is the first time it's ever been explored thoroughly and published. So, uh, but it shows that you really need to be very careful uh, using uh, vitronite from uh, from a, uh, a, a saprophyllic shale uh, to calibrate your basin models. It's uh, it's not likely to give you the, the correct vitronite reading. So here's then the summary. Um, vitronite reflectance increases uh, due to a combination of densification and aromatic condensation reactions. The densification is the primary factor in in uh, in the oil generation uh, range, it, when you get up to high maturity, then the uh, the long uh, polycondensed aromatics become important, and you can use the anisotropy of graphite and the anisotropy of kerogen to really understand this issue of the, the importance of the aromatic condensation reactions and the uh, orientation. So uh, the second conclusion is the the evidence is pretty strong that uh, easy percent R zero underestimate vit not reflectance at high maturity. Um, we developed two models in the past five years. One is the DL model, and the other is the V model. They have a, a sharper dog light near the end of oil generation, which corresponds to this onset of of, of very many condensation reactions. Um, my preference is the, the V model. It's derived from uh, from the 2018, and it uses this frequency factor in the 10 to the 15th range, which I think is the one that gives you the best agreement with laboratory results as well as geologic conditions. And and so using the same algorithm, but just a different uh, uh, input parameters for the the kerogen, uh, it inspired the the uh, this this B model for bitumen reflectance, which I showed you works pretty well. And finally, as I showed you, bitumenite suppression is real. So um, it, it's really quite dangerous to use bitumenite, um, even if it is true bitumenite, in a uh, uh, oil prone uh, shale to do your uh, basin uh, calibration. And so that uh, concludes my presentation. I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Yeah, thank yeah, you very much. Thank you very, much. That's very good. Some echo I have. So I, I try to read up if there are any questions in the conversation. And if somebody has any question live, what you can do is that you just raise the hand in the in the 
list of participants and then I, I you can I can pick if somebody has a question. I just check first the chat. It's a very nice overview, Alan. Uh, we understand it better now. So basically one question from somebody who is called PB guest. I don't know who that is. Maybe they can reveal themselves. Do you suggest using diamondoids and other kind of data as supplement to vitrinite as maturity indicator in type of in, in cases of type two and type three source rocks in base modeling? Well, I think it's a little bit different topic. It's geochemistry and diamondoids, but what do you think, Ellen? Well, certainly diamondoids um, are, you know, Mike Muldowan's work, who is also at Stanford, obviously, uh, did a lot of work in that. Um, it's not really my expertise. My Mostly what I have uh, noted them doing is using the diamondoids to, when you have mixed oil sources to try to uh, separate out some uh, maturity issues. But uh, it's, it's that's really not, uh, really not my expertise, so I uh, probably shouldn't stick my neck out too far on that. But uh, using multiple indices uh, obviously is a good idea. I, you know, I, I that general concept, in, in including the fission track and yielding and all those sorts of things, um, are is a wise idea. Use as many different indicators as you can. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, Birte has a question. Oh, oh. I think you can hear me now. Hi, Alan. Nice to see you again. <laughs> oh yeah. Hi. Hi, um, I have actually several questions. One of them is, I need to start somewhere. Um, you are talking about different kerogen types and you are measuring vitronite in type 1 kerogen. And my comment is that a type 1 kerogen, a pure type 1 kerogen, actually should not contain any vitronite because, I mean, all kerogen types are more or less mixtures and uh, there are I would say mainly two members, end members. One of them is type 1, the alginite. 100% alginite doesn't have any vitrinite. And the other extreme is actually the vitrinite, which is the other end member is the coals, vitrinitic or vitri vitric coal. And type 2 keratins are just mixtures. So, um, and the mixtures is, well, the type 2 is defined by um, the shale in the Paris Basin, the Tuash in Shale and Paris Basin. And you can have different kinds of um, type 2 carogens, which are which is due to mixtures. And that's what you can see if you look in the microscope, that you can have different um, uh, proportions of the different uh, mass rels, algae, spores, pollen, uh, different vitrinites, particles, and they give you some kind of type 2, but they can differ also. And you would also, that's also why you see in these uh, kinetics, if you do kinetic measurements in the lab, that they vary. So that was the one. So, uh, and I totally agree with that you uh, have some lipped liptinitic or uh, bituminous uh, coli materials, you get the suppression of the vitrinite. That was one thing. And Can I, uh, I yeah, okay. the first question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, um, so when, uh, the, the algorithms I used for the type 1 and type 2 and type 3, those are for the reflectance of that particular material, not vitrinite. In other words, the, the, the type 1 is the reflectance of the type 1, type 1 material. Okay. Not not the uh, of of the and then I agree that uh, that certainly uh, almost all materials have mixtures of, of kerogen types from mixtures of input. Um, I'm not quite sure it's fair to say that type two kerogen is a mixture of type three and type one. It comes from different organisms that have a different chemical composition. Yeah. But you can still have mixtures <laughs> in type yeah. one. You know, you, you go. You know the. Um, hydrogen index from you know yep. 300 to 600 you know those yep. are just uh, sometimes mixtures sometimes different materials but anyway yep. go, proceed. Uh, I, I, I totally agree it's just, just to clarify that you be, need to be a little bit precise on what kind of material you use because as I'm trying to say you can have different kinds of type 2 and uh, yeah. Yeah and so, so let me clarify that the some people also don't like the concept of the type one, type two classification. They prefer the, uh, you know, the the BP uh, approach. But but to be clear, since since my correlations are on elemental composition, yeah. it, 
it, it becomes the, the type one, type two that is actually the relevant comparison, not the uh, the depositional environment per se. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, another comment. Yeah, uh, thank you for clarifying it uh, because that's yeah. I totally agree. But uh, another thing was that you said that it's difficult to do some calibration with uh, low mature sediments, right? Um, mature. I, I, let me see. I said that I had not really paid much attention to the very low maturity, you know, yeah. basically yeah. oxygen to carbon ratio greater than about, you know, 0.3. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really in the diagenesis range. It could be done. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And that's uh, where I'm coming from, because when you remember, I did some experiments with these low mature coals, and that's when I realized that when I used these low mature coals, they had a different way of, of maturing, uh, which probably had to do with that these very early stages, and that's also what you uh, learn in cold photology, are actually controlled by diagenesis, which means that uh, different, a lot of different processes going on very early on, and first later on, it's taken over by temperatures. So to do some experimental, uh, um, yeah, uh, to do some experiments, you should start with the coal that more or less has passed these very, very first low mature stadium, uh, where you lose the oxygen. And that is, then you are up in the range of 0.45 or something like that. And from there on, it's mainly governed by temperature. So that was just a little comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, so I remember back a long time ago, you know, the as you get into the high oxygen content, you know, those, those reactions tend to be a lot more um, dependent on the conditions. And so if you do rapid pyrolysis on a, on a high oxygen material, you're just not going to uh, mimic the uh, geological maturation at all. Oh. I mean, that's that's really been known for decades. <laughs> okay, thank you much. Uh, thank you, Beatrice, for the question. Now there is a question from Jens Martin. So Jens, you can speak up. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Burnham. I had some um, some vitronite reflection data. You, to use for my um, master study uh, when I did that with Sir Nelson, and they were apparently lower than the Burnham and Sweeney model. They were from the Central North Sea and uh, probably suppressed due to high pressure. Is that something you can comment on? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting subject. Um... The, the, the question is whether or not pressure actually does uh, suppress vitronite reflectance. Um, I, I know that a number of people have, have uh, proposed that. There was some, uh, some work um, actually at Stanford uh, before I was involved at Stanford that, that explored the effect of pressure. So we do know that the effect of pressure, there is an effect of pressure. Uh, the question is, uh, um, you know, the Stanford, when you look at the Stanford results, they, they did very, very a large uh, pressure ranges, but if you look over the relevant geologic pressure range, it should be a fairly small effect. Whether or not that's really pre effective pressure or really effective something else, I think is still an open question, uh, at least in my mind. Um, you know, I know that uh, when talking to, uh, to Ken Peters about this issue, he's not convinced that there is an effective pressure per se. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Any question from the audience? Or you can write in the chat. Um, no more yet. Or I can ask in the meantime if somebody has any question. I mean, thank you very much again. It's very, very good to go through all these uh, different models. And my question is that in the Sweeney and Burnham 1990 publication, which has been used by the whole world in 30 years, I think the biggest implication is for the shallower buried areas because the newer models have lower uh, calculated reflectivity and basically that has a big implication on source of maturity in uh, shallow buried basins. What do you think of that? Uh, has anybody done any case studies on that or any? Both the basin RO and also your new models have lower reflectance. And if people use the older version, then they had to have higher heat flows to calibrate, and then basically they overestimated maturities in the in the in the shallow buried sections. Or 
is there any newer case study on it or is there any what do you think of that implications so the only the only um basin studies that really looked at that uh, that i'm very familiar with is the work that uh that was done at Stanford on the North Slope, and, and they they felt that they had a very good um, constraint on the heat flow, and therefore were able to, uh, you know, in any basin studies, you you, you have a number of parameters <laughs> that are floating, and you can do you can compensate uh, one for the other, and so the question is how unique is any given answer. Um, they felt that they had a good heat flow constraint, and so that was the one that that was with the uh, that. Uh, resulted in the DL model with some uh, some uh, modeling by uh, uh, Shankit uh, Schlumberger. Um, I, I got pushback from our collaborators at, at Total who didn't believe that there was really that much of a, a lowering of the reflectance. And, and so when I did the, the more recent models, I was I maintained a closer to uh, the original model. I'm not sure that it's different within any kind of scatter of the data, the, the V model, um, except for when, you know, uh, when you get uh, into the higher range. So, um, you know, it's, it, this gets back to the issue. It, it, um, it, it's easy to fit data um, with parameters. The question is, you know, you know how, how rigorous do you know number one the, the data and the conditions <laughs> and and so uh, yeah I, I you also then ask the question what is the the point of dimension returns and and, and is it uh, so I, I i guess the question the, to to answer your question is that uh, you know we we at stanford don't think that the uh, the basin percent r zero model is is correct for for vitronite in 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 uh, non oil prone materials now there may be people who can make the case that, that we're wrong and, and that will be fine. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Any question? Now you can bring out your case studies, your basins, your questions and uh, problems if you have any in your, your own area or where you work. Anybody from the audience, if you raise your hand, you can speak up now or you write in the chat. Now Christian Ongard has one question. Maybe Christian, you can just shortly say who you are and where you work and uh, the question. Yeah, hello Bolic. Uh, thank you for the talk, Mr. Burnham. Very nice. I'm Christian Ongard, Petroleum System Analyst, uh, doing consultancy work in water energy these days. And also involved in something we call dig science together with uh, Professor Peralset. He used to work as a professor, not a professor, but uh, associate in Stanford actually. Anyway, the new models you have developed, both the ECRO DL and the ECRO V. Do you know if the commercial companies have implemented this in their commercial simulators? Well, I, I know that the DL model is in uh, in, in Basin Mod. No, but let me see. Yeah, yeah that's the slimmer version, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and I had some re uh, recent conversations uh, mentioning that I thought that they needed to put the, the other models in there. Uh, they're they're kind of slow at putting in models. I guess the other thing that uh, I would point out that uh, uh, a lot of the chemical kinetic models that, that I developed in the 1990s aren't in there and they a model that people use a lot is one was developed back in like 1986 when it was, you know, kind of like 75 percent guesswork. And I'm surprised that that's still even uh, used. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think it would be, uh, if people uh, would like to explore these other models, just suggesting that the, uh, the code developers uh, include them, that I think that could be done. It's really not very difficult in the sense that the basic structure there is, is is already present. It's just a matter of changing the input parameters and, and, uh, and putting another menu. Okay, thank you. Actually, I can confirm, Christian, that in Petromod it is implemented, not uh, not the V model, but the DL and the yeah. the Basin RO. They are implemented. Also, the Ritter model is implemented, I think, and the and of course the ZRO 
implemented. So yeah, you can choose from four in Petromod at least. I don't know. I, maybe in Trinity was, I don't know, on the top of my head. And I don't know about IFP or the other one, the, the Pat River software, if it still exists. I don't know. But there's one more question in the chat. I can just read up or uh, you want to uh, read up uh, Per Bach? Well, it's your choice. You can speak up if you want. Yeah, it's easy. ROTR is in Petromod. Yes, yes, it is. But anyway, I can read up. So the question is that from uh, Per Bach, in high pressure and high temperature environments in HTHP, uh, it generates high amounts of CO2 and also H2S. This might suppress the vitrinite reflectance. Would it be correct? That's the question. Um, I wouldn't think that, um, that either CO2 or sulfur should suppress the vitrinite. Um, sulfur uh, has a lot of electrons, <laughs> and, and if anything, its group contribution to refractive index is, is relatively high. So I would think that that's not, would not be a, a factor for suppression. Um, and I'm not sure how CO2 um, would work mechanistically. What you really need for suppression is ways of maintaining hydrogen content uh, in, in the kerogen. And, and neither of those materials would seem to, to have the ability to do that. One more question just uh, turned up. Sebastian Hinsken is asking, what is the uncertainty range in the percentage in the prediction with the EZROV, the new method? Um, it's a good question. Um, I guess you, in using this, I, I, I really think of uh, the uncertainty being, you know, you can think of standard deviation, a single and a double standard deviation. Maybe a single standard deviation is about, uh, is about 0.1, maybe. Um, maybe that's, maybe it's not quite that uncertain, but I would say that that would be a good guess. So, um, and and I guess the question the, the question also in in return might be when you see a scatter plot of vitronite, um, you know what uh, is the uncertainty in the model or the uncertainty in the data bigger? And <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I know the answer to that either. Yeah, it's right. Many times, the, actually, the the different laboratories have different trends, and it has been shown and even published many years ago that some laboratories tend to have always lower, others always higher for the same exactly the same material. So it is it is some human input, of course, in in the measurements. That's that's always there. So I'm just asking the audience that anybody else has any question because time is running now late. It's only like seven minutes left. Anybody? Any nice uh, case study from any basin, like any exotic basin from Mexico or from Brazil or from Angola or any other very fast subsiding? Actually, maybe then I, I can ask this. Uh, if, the, if the methods uh, now are uh, different uh, calibration models exist and what is the implication of using them in, for example, very fast subsiding basins like Gulf of Mexico or Azerbaijan, South Caspian, Niger Delta, mm, for example. I think these, these three, four are very, very, they, they are characterized by very fast sedimentation, very high sedimentation rate in the Pliocene, Pleistocene. Any implication on that? Uh, well, so uh, yes, that goes back to the, the very original uh, concept of of is is vitrinite reflectance um, basically just a temperature indicator, or does it depend on time? And and the answer to the question is really the higher the frequency factor gets, the the more independent the the result is with time. So the the V model will will have um, uh, the least uh, the least effect of. Uh, of, of the, the subside, uh, uh, sub substance um, and 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 uh, you know I, I uh, but there, there still is the time issue of course but it's uh, uh, 
at least that's that's my uh, that's my recollection. I, I hope I didn't get the sign wrong, but <laughs> but anyway, my um, yeah, the higher yeah the higher activation energy frequency factor I, do, I believe makes it a less temperature dependent. Okay, thank you very much. So basically, the last uh, chance for anybody to ask questions or raise hand. I go back to the conversation. I don't see any more questions on it from anybody. So last oh, chance. Yeah. Yeah. No, let me just add one thing. I think I actually did address that issue um, in in the uh, the article that it, it was in the um, the AEPG bulletin or not bulletin the uh, let's see the uh, uh, the magazine that they have. I actually explored that issue. So I, ha uh, I can take you, uh, if you take a look at that one, uh, yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> I think that's the one where I uh, uh, looked at the issue of the, uh, the the temperature dependence and the substance rate, so, yeah. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's in the APG uh, Explorer, actually, from yeah, Explorer, uh, yeah. June, June this year. 2000, it's not sharp image, but APG Explorer. Yeah, basically some persons, or some people asked uh, yeah, whether the presentation will be shared or not. Yes, it's been recorded and it will be posted on the force.org and the force YouTube channel. And then um, basically any last, last question before we close the session, anybody? I don't see any hands and I don't see any questions in the chat. So everybody understood what we should do and we should use now the newest methods. And then, of course, in the basic modeling tools, I know that in Petro it's implemented, probably in also Trinity implemented. IFP, I don't know, but actually what you said is correct that if you have the reactions, you can just make a copy of an existing kinetic scheme and then modify it and then you can create it. Basically, you can, you can even modify, you can create customized ones if you want. So that's not a, not a big issue in, in the modeling software. You can just create them. So I think then uh, thank you very much for all of you participating and thank you very much, Alan, for your time and kind contribution. And then basically, I hope that in the next uh, 30 years, we will use these new models now. And then uh, basically, um, I would like you have a good day, all of you, and then uh, thank you very much again, Ellen, for the nice uh, presentation. And basically, we can close the session, and then uh, I wish Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you, and hopefully the COVID will soon disappear. We don't know. And then I can just mention that in the next uh, half year, we also will have kind of webinar because it's very easy to organize, and it's, it's all these COVID rules, it's easy to, to comply with. So basically, we will have it later on. And also, Alan, if you are interested in some of these, you can just join. We can invite you as a, as a listener. We, we try to invite, for example, Alexei Milkov on the gas isotopes and maybe Andy Pepper on, on his new article on source rocks and exp expulsion efficiencies and those. So we try to do it every, every month uh, from next year or so onwards. So thank you very much for all of you and then have a good day. And have a good day, Alan, in California. Here it's getting very dark and 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 night, but uh, for you the day just started there. So yes. Anyway, well, thank you for inviting me. I I enjoyed it. Okay. And Have a good day, yeah. all of you. Bye bye yeah. then. You can bye -bye. close the recording then, uh, Lina. Yeah. Thank you.